So welcome to our Citizens Climate Lobby online climate advocate training. If you want our slides after the workshop, you can get them at cclusa.org slash June dash cat W. I'm Ellie and I'll be one of your hosts today. Before we start, we wanna welcome all of you and ask you to introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're joining by typing your city in the chat window. I see some folks are doing that already. You can tell us if you'd like how you heard about CCL and if you're connected to your local chapter already. A big thank you for joining us. Before we get started, we want to acknowledge that you are taking time away from your family, your friends, your hobbies to listen to this lesson and work on something that is so much bigger than ourselves. And we are extremely grateful. We also want to give a shout out and welcome to our attendees calling in from around the world, doing critical work in building political will for carbon fee and dividend style policy solutions across the globe. Today, we're going to focus on the US model of our chapters, but we know that most of it will apply to your efforts outside of the US as well. I'm just gonna jump in to introducing myself and then I'll pass the baton to Salemi and Ellie. So a little bit of background behind myself. Uh, my name is Brett Cease. I've been volunteering with CCL for a decade and now am the Volunteer Education and Engagement Director. And my whole goal is to make sure that you have learning pathways to make you empowered and informed as citizen and constituent lobbyists. We're so glad you're here and I'll pass it to you to jump in next, so Lenny. Thank you, Brad. My name is Solemi Hernandez. Welcome, everybody. I have the honor to be CCL Southeast Regional Coordinator covering Florida, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. I learned about CCL in 2017 and immediately signed up to be a volunteer inspired by CCL mission to create a political will for climate solutions. I am currently enrolled as a political science part-time student at Florida Gulf Coast University. And I have been a grassroots activist and community organizer for many years in Florida. And I'm also the mother of two wonderful boys, Alexander and Patrick. And I'll pass awesome. it to you, Ellie. Thank you. So I'm Ellie Sparks, Director of Field Development. I started as a volunteer with CCL a little over a decade ago, starting the first chapter in Virginia. That was in Richmond. And I joined up as staff about six years ago. And my job is to support everybody who wants to help start new chapters across the country, also help people as they're figuring out how to bring new volunteers on board into the existing chapters. I work with our regional coordinators. I have my hands in a couple of action teams and you'll hear about that. I'm involved with the coal country action team to honor my Appalachian roots and also involved with agriculture. I'm a big fan of regenerative agriculture as a way to sequester carbon in plants and soil. So Salemi, back to you. Thank you, Ellie. So let's find out a little bit more about each of our attendees today too. Find the chat button on your Airmin screen, click that button and please chat using one word, where do you live and what you are most committed to in life and why. So far, we've got some folks that are super, uh, super engaged in regenerative agriculture. Those that are here to tune up their skills, deepen their knowledge base, address the climate change for future generation. We've got people calling in from all throughout uh, the country, a lot of Californians some background uh, in public TV. This is great. Keep sharing backgrounds where you're coming from and uh, what you are committed to in life as we learn from each other. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Ellie. Awesome, thank you, Brett. So we know that a lot of you are pretty new and many of you are taking our training today to get ready for your lobby meetings coming up in the next week or so. So today we're going to cover CCL's organization structure and our values how citizens create political will, the tools we use to create the political will. We're, we will cover our methodology. We'll do some lobby training. We'll discuss the Energy Innovation Act and key elements towards addressing climate change that meet the scale of the climate problem in the time frame we need it to. So with that overview, let's get started. And Salemi, will you start us off with our seven core values? Of course. So we often talk about the CC, CCL way of doing things, but what are citizens' climate lobby values? 
as Citizens Climate Lobby is growing so quickly, is key that all our thousands of supporters are on the same page. Our volunteers, our, our values are something we use to guide our decisions. How we respond to others is like a home base we, can, we know we can return to. CCL recognized seven core values that are essential to our identity. Integrity, focus, optimism, relationship, personal power, being nonpartisan, and diversity. So let's explore each of these briefly. Ellie, would you like to start? Sure, so focus. Our focus is the single most impactful solution to climate change, a national carbon fee. We know it will not solve the problem entirely, and we appreciate the work that our friends and other groups are doing. To be effective, we do not let ourselves get distracted by work that does not su support our core purpose. So let me, optimism. My favorite, Ellie, we believe that people are good and that democracy works. We are confident that our approach will work because we see progress. We stand for a solution, not in protest of other solutions. We are a community that offers one another comfort, support, and fun as we work. And I'll jump in here too with the importance of relationships. We take the most generous approach to other people as possible. That grounded as volunteers in appreciation, gratitude, and respect. We listen, we work to find common values, and we endeavor to understand our own biases, because we all got them. We know that there's a place for protest, but our approach is in building consensus. Next is integrity. We are prepared and do our research. We are always on time for meetings. Our approach is thoughtful and true. We consult experts and use data. We are open to new information, and in fact, we solicit opposing opinions. Personal power. We use our voices to be heard. This simple act transforms us from spectators to engaged citizens, and it reveals the true nature of democracy to us. We are volunteer-driven, trusting volunteers to make important decisions and to create and develop things that will be valued by Citizens Climate Lobby. Next is diversity. We empower everyone in exercising their personal and political power, regardless of race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, religion, or political affili affiliation. We seek out support and elevate people whose voices may not have been fully heard. And nonpartisan, we are open to all who are serious about solving climate change. We don't judge each other on where we live, what we wear, what we do for a living, or who we voted for in the last election. We work with elected officials and community leaders from across the political spectrum. We believe everyone is a potential ally all right, so now that we've reviewed our seven core values, Salemi is going to tell us about CCL structure and regions within the U.S. Thank you, Ali. So let's do a quick poll. Which value that we just share are you most identified with? Please look at the poll opening right now and indicate your interest in where you like to grow. You can choose multiple values. Okay, as you enter your answers, let's get started by reviewing how is CCL organized? Citizens Climate Lobby is a volunteer-driven organization organized locally by chapters. The term chapter and group are used interchangeably, but they mean the same thing. A group or a chapter is a local team that is creating political will and clear evidence that citizens support, climate, support action on climate change within a congressional district or within a state. Citizens Climate Lobby has hundreds of groups across North America, from cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Toronto to Pocatello, Idaho, has diverse Mississippi. We also have chapters across Europe, Australia, Africa, Asia, and Central America. Each chapter has a group leader or couple of co-leaders who help organize and coordinate the local activities of the group. Groups may be in various stages of development. One group may have one person who is just getting started, who's just getting started in the group, 
And there are, there's others, more established group that have dozens of members. If you're new to Citizens Climate Lobby and haven't connected with your local chapter, then you want to do so as soon as possible. Now that we have discussed our group, group leaders and structure, I would discuss the lia their liaison role. One other role we should mention here is that of the congressional liaison. A CCL liaison is someone who is representing, who is the representative for CCL when the group contacts a congressional staff. Since there are 535 members of Congress, CCL goal is to have a personal liaison for each of those offices and their staff. The liaison builds ongoing relationship with their members of Congress and their staff by maintaining regular personal contact and by coordinating the group meetings and communication with that office. This can be anything from sending a car when your member experiences a significant event, update the office with timely resources related to climate change, or even inviting the staff to a local barbecue. We are working on a complex issue, climate change. So having one consistent point of contact with the office of each member of Congress make our process of communicating about climate change and our solution much more effective. The liaison is the representative for the CCL chapter and the liaison have the goal of moving that member of Congress toward supporting the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Here's an important point of clarification. Even though we have liaisons, each CCL volunteer is encouraged to personally bribe and call the members of Congress and do so frequently. Awesome. And with that, yeah, I'll jump in on confidentiality. Um, one important point about these relationships we are building with Congress and congressional offices and the confidentiality we expect from each other, from our volunteers, it's essential that we do not repeat outside or share via notes or emails what we hear in our meetings with Congress. We leave it to the members of Congress, even if they are vocally enthusiastic, to make their own public statements about climate. Bottom line, whether it is a seemingly casual question about policy details or any other private comments, it is critical to train ourselves to respect what is said in confidence. When we consistently demonstrate we can be trusted in this way, it then opens the door for deeper conversations that can move our members of Congress forward. Back to you, Salemi. Connect to build those relationships of trust. Let's explore the CCL concept of looking for common ground, because finding common ground is the key to any long-term relationship. And long-term relationships are what CCL is all about. Building a long-term relationship with members of Congress and their staff are critical for our success. Here's the good news. We're absolutely convinced that we can find some common ground with anyone. When we look for common ground, we start in three places. We look for share, we look for shared values, we look for social connections, and we look at places we care about. Regardless shared value, it can start on the most simple level. If you have kids, consider that most members of Congress have kids around and are concerned for their future as well. So during meeting introductions, mention your kids or grandkids. And I pass it back to you, Brett. Yeah, a couple other ideas for using shared values include your religious beliefs, your outlook for a safe and prosperous future, the importance of energy independence for you, or freedom of choice. Regardless of what those values are, it's important that you identify them, and rather than seeing an issue at loggerheads, use those values as a way to frame out how you can identify the problem from a, sh a shared vantage point. So you're grounded in those shared values, working together on a common problem. On social connections, we take the time to meet with the people we learn uh, to we meet with to learn about them in advance seriously. So for members of Congress, we find out about former jobs, boards they've served on, schools they attended. You can do the same thing with uh, aides, especially right now in the LinkedIn era. Staffers, members of Congress, all their information is online, and we can also do that when we're in person, getting to them to talk about themselves. That's how you build a long-term relationship. 
It gets them talking about themselves instead of feeling lectured in. And if there's a hometown or a college connection, we wanna make sure to bring that voice to our next meeting as well. And lastly, common ground can literally be just that, a patch of ground on this earth, our own turf, a place that we know that the member of Congress or the staffer cherishes. We know that no matter who we talk to, people love their home community passionately. And so in just a little bit, we'll jump into an exercise to get us all thinking about our own stories as a basis for common ground. Uh, but before that, I'll pass it to you, Ellie, to review our one rule. Thank you, Brett. So what Salemi and Brett shared with you, that technique of building relationships with our members of Congress works. We hear it from Congress. They tell us. One of our liaisons, Carl, said, our Congresswoman has more than once closed our meetings by telling us that we inspire her, that we are, quote, the true patriots. Every day she manifests a fundamental trust in America's democracy and she lets us know that Citizens Climate Lobby helps her feel that way. So we often start our meetings or our letters to the editor with a message of appreciation. Now, this is important to set the stage with the person we're talking to, but it also helps us. It helps us to remove that chip we might have on our shoulder, holding something against another person. So we have one and one rule only in CCL, and that is to treat everyone, even those who disagree with us, with respect, appreciation, and gratitude. We meet them where they are rather than where we want them to be. So back to you, Salemi. Thank you, Ellie. At Citizens Climate Lobby, we focus on what we want. We want to solve the climate crisis. We want a livable planet. In this exercise, we get down on the ground, exploring what you want to preserve. A quote by EBY helped us frame our exercise. Before I read it, Open your chat and tell us who is Evie White, if you know it. Oh, we got a couple in there. Thank you so much. To set all this up, here's the quote of Evie White, author of the Charlotte Wet and Elements of Style, gave in an interview with the New York Times in 1969. Every morning, I wake up turned between a desire to save the world and an inclination to savor it. This makes it hard to plan the day. We in CCL might add, but if we forget to savor the word, what possible reason do we have for saving it? In a way, the savoring must come first. Let me repeat that last part. If we forget to savor the word, what possible reason do we have for saving it? Even though there has been some different opinions with who we talk about what is causing the climate to change or just how much humans are responsible for, we can all agree that there is something special on this earth that we want to be around for future generations. Having something we savor on this earth is the common ground we all share. In the exercise that we're gonna do in just a minute, I will ask you to identify a specific play, a place that you love that is not threatened to be, that is, that is threatened to be negatively impacted by climate change. We're not talking about a generic type of place like the beach, nor do we mean to focus on a place that is threatened by other environmental factors like over pollution, like, like overdevelopment or toxic pollution. Let's specifically key into how climate change is and will impact the places we care for. If it's in your hometown and congressional district, all the better to establish that common ground. The reason the reason we ask this is that social science research has shown people connect much more strongly with their own backyard and concerns for their community than far off impacts. So think about what your place looks like, uh, looks and sound like in your mind. Try to paint a descriptive picture for us to help us really understand what you savor about it. If possible, tie in the potential impacts on your local community, a, a, your on local economies that your community faces as well, as well as reduce workforce and agriculture, productivity, extreme heat, droughts, wildfires, inland flooding, disease vector expansions, seafood yields. There's so many ways that to make your story 
personal and connect a common ground like the, like the natural world and economic well-being. This exercise is a way to begin developing a story that you can share with others. Stories are very powerful means of connecting with people and the more prepared we are to share our own and make personal connection, the more likely we are to find a common ground. Stories are also a way for us to humanize climate change and help those around us to deepen their concern for take for caretaking and preserving these places for future generations. Let's consider what we love about life. Maybe family traditions or a simple special spot in nature, perhaps music, art, poetry, a certain way of life. Let's record what we love about life on Earth, describing it in great detail. Please have a pen and paper handy. But first, I would love to share something very specific about a place I love and how it is impacted by climate change. I live in Florida. I love the natural spaces, the biodiversity, the smell of the seawater mixing with the fresh growing flowers along the streamways. I love alligators and the birds like, and the birds like, they're like this beautiful spoonbill. The Everglades ecosystem overall cleans our water. Here's the sad part. Everything in the Everglades is threatened by climate change. There is saltwater intrusion, extreme weather is impacting the bee bugs, roots, so they, are, they aren't as resilient or grow as strong as they used to. All of these impact Florida tourism and economy, which means less jobs on top of all the natural world impact. Because today we are focused on getting the most information in the shortest amount of time, we're going to encourage you to put that time into practice by chatting with each other. It's so inspirational to see everyone's stories from Laguna Beach to the Grove of the Patriarchs to talking about all of the natural diversity of California, Virginia, upstate New York. Keep going with your experiences and expressions of what you savor and why we're in this together. But for now, as you practice sharing and reminding ourselves, like E.B. White says, in what we're grounded in, we're going to keep moving forward. And with that, I'll actually pass it to you, Ellie, to close us with that activity. There we go. <laughs> and unmute. All right. So let's step out and up and into space. Nearly 20 years ago, our founder, Marshall Saunders, was at church and heard a story about astronaut Rusty Schweikert. And when Marshall hosted the first climate advocate training in person, what we're doing today, uh, in San Diego, he actually included part of that sermon in the Climate Advocate Training. So I'm gonna read that excerpt to you. During his Apollo mission in 1969, astronaut Rusty Schweikert was let out of the capsule on an umbilical cord. Usually NASA keeps the astronauts compulsively busy up there, but a peculiar thing happened to Schweikert. Just as he emerged from the capsule, Something went wrong inside the capsule. Both Mission Control in Houston and the remaining astronauts had to concentrate on the problem. This left Rusty all alone, floating around Mother Earth in complete cosmic silence. During this time, Rusty had two profound conversion experiences. He looked back on Mother Earth, quote, a shining gem against a totally black backdrop and realized everything he cherished was on that gem. His family and land, music and human history with its folly and its grandeur. He was so overcome that he wanted to, quote, hug and kiss that gem like a mother does her firstborn child. Compassion flowed through him. Trained as a jet fighter pilot, he was a typical macho man, but a breakthrough of something bigger came washing over him in that moment in space. Rusty Schweikert's second awakening in space was a political one. He was a red, white, and blue American who believed what he had always been taught, that the world was divided between the communist world and the free world. Yet, while floating around Mother Earth, he saw that rivers flowed indiscriminately between Russia and Europe. 
that ocean currents served communist, socialist, and capitalist nations alike, that clouds did not stop at borders to test for political ideology, and that there are no nations. Nations exist in the mind of the human race alone. On returning to NASA, Schweikert was not debriefed by any spiritual director about his mystical experiences. He confesses to having wandered about in a state of stupor for six months, bumping into walls while asking himself repeatedly this one question, why did God do this to me? Finally, he concluded that God did this through him so that others might hear the message. What message? Compassion interdependence, shared beauty on this glistening, shining planet. The holy earth, we must take such care of it. It must take such care of us. This side of heaven, we are each of us so nearly all the other has. There is darkness all around us, yet between us, there is just enough light to get by. So let me back to you. Thank you, Ellie. Many people are familiar with our vision to create the political will for a livable world. We know that politicians don't create political will, they respond to it. And that is our job as citizens to create so much political will that politicians have no other choice than do what we ask them, what we ask of them. Citizens Climate Lobby teaches citizens how to empower themselves how to develop relationship with their representatives so that they, so that we can help Congress see there's political will for carbon fee and dividend legislation. We endeavor to show people that your voice will make a difference. We strive to enable individual breakthrough in the exercise of personal and political power. But, but what does this mean? We have all the spirit, we have, we have, all had experiences in life when we discovered a newly found source of strength and inner ability to realize that through our active through our active participation in a cause we could make a difference whether it's starting your own your own business going back to school after a divorce mentoring a young adult in your community think about a time in your life when you realize that by participating in something larger than yourself, you were part of a collective process that was making a difference. And while you reflect, if we say our vision is to create political will, then we should clarify more precisely what we mean. Think of political will as actions our chapter strategically take to demonstrate to Congress that the will of the people is to have a sustainable climate. So what does that look like? Political will is really just the clear demonstration of support back home. Legislators need to know a specific actionable step, not that we want a sustainable climate and a strong economy. They want to hear what policies we want enacted so that they can act on the people's will. That's precisely what we'll get in just a moment. But first, a little bit more, why we use the methodology, methodology we do. We organize people by congressional districts, which we have found to be the most effective way to meet with and demonstrate political will to Congress. And through our decade of organizing, organizing we have learned from many others about what creates political will and what does not. Here's why that's important. We know, we know as volunteers, you're giving us something so precious, your time. And we know that you don't have an infinity supply of it and could be doing many other things instead. So we only ask you as a CCL volunteer to do things that we know will have a very good chance of demonstrating the will of the people. We take actions that we know will be successful in having members of Congress move in the direction of our legislation. So what are those levers? Let's jump into exploring each of those, but here's a quick overview of all five of them. If you can count on your hand with me, they are lobbying Congress, media relations, grassroots outreach, 
grass tops engagement, and group development and organizing. Let's review each of these in depth, and you can start thinking about which of those are most exciting for you. Back to you, Salemi. First, there's lobbying. Nothing is more impactful than citizens meeting frequently with the members of Congress or the staff. So we meet with them often in order to build a relationship of trust and show them that this legislation is, is something that their constituents want and to educate them on how our proposal will impact their state or district. In a chapter, four to five volunteers aim to meet regularly with members of Congress and their staff. These days, lobby teams use video chat for these meetings. In between meetings, like we talked about earlier, a special volunteer called a CCL liaison checks in frequently with congressional offices. The activities in the other levers provide the deliver deliverables to demonstrate interest, concern, and desires from the district or state. Lobby is the most highly leveraged activity we can do. Next, we have media. We work with both print and digital media in order to drive the conversation toward the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Our local chapters media teams coordinate work with local media, newspaper, TV, radio, and social media. They write letters to the editors. Many letters graduates, graduate to op-ed. CCL volunteers secure, secure editorial pages endorsements where a newspaper when a newspaper that endorses a member of Congress also endorses the bill, it sends a powerful message that to that member of Congress, we got your back if you support this bill. Creating political will through media may include becoming the point person for a local newspaper to watch for opportunities for writing letters to the editor, writing letters to the editors and op-ed of your own, spreading social stories and coverage across social media, getting to know your editorial board and key reporters at your local or state newspaper. All right, and grassroots outreach, my favorite. So a lot of people care about climate change. Yale tells us that 66% of Americans are at least somewhat concerned. Our job at CCL is to bring those voices to Congress. So we recruit people to write letters, to email, to join our monthly calling campaign. And we might do that informally, talking to friends and family, or when the pandemic ends and we can get back outside, we're tabling at events and recruiting people to join our monthly calling campaign at those tabling events. Our volunteers also give presentations. Now, you might think, I don't wanna give a presentation, but I know somewhere someone could give a presentation. We love that. Some of our volunteers are the presenters. Some of our volunteers are the schedulers to line up the presentations, which could be a Zoom presentation. These days we do that. Uh, it also could be that you're networking and organizing the names that you might that a presenter might gather at a presentation. I want to mention on this slide our action teams. These are volunteers organized across the country around specific topics. I'm a fan of the agriculture action team, coal country. We've got a lot of action teams, higher education, ocean impacts. Check out our action team page. Brett just put that in the chat. All right, and grass tops, another favorite. This uh, Congress tells us over and over again, we need to hear from local respected leaders that it's important for us to step up and solve the climate crisis. So that's another job we do as volunteers in CCL. We bring those local leaders to the table, maybe in a lobby meeting, maybe they sign an endorsement letter. Um, we are one way or another helping to bring their voice to the member of Congress. If you're going to join the grassroots team, you might do some research to figure out who those influencers could be. You might be part of the team to reach out to those leaders, meet with them, build a relationship, ask for their endorsement, and then hopefully bring them into a meeting with a member of Congress. And again, the focus is diverse depending on who your member of Congress wants to hear from. So Brett, would you put, there's another link to put in, oh, the supporters for the Energy Innovation Act. That's fun to see endorsements we've already gotten. 
to yeah, write. Yeah, by all means, I'll put that in the chat. Know. And while I do that, uh, please feel free to also think through, is group development your cup of tea? Do you Are you a social person? Have people told you you're a people person and you like welcoming people into the group? Are you concerned about making sure that your group is also representative of your overall community, looking around who isn't there? Think through with that fifth level of political will group organizing. If you'd like to mentor new volunteers, set up co-working parties, help your group be diversified, this is a great lever for you if you'd like to help be that social glue for the rest of your chapter. And just as a quick overview, you know, we like to think of these five levers of political will interacting with each other, as you see here on this chart, kind of building up to ultimately influencing Congress. But I also like to think of it as a menu. You're sitting down to your favorite restaurant again after you're resuming from COVID. What's your favorite dish? Please do not eat everything on the menu. What would you like to order as your first hors d'oeuvre to whet your appetite and get involved with CCL? All of these have a strategic role. They all are interconnected. We need everyone across all of these levers to work and row in the same direction. So I'm going to open up a poll for you to think about what you'd like to get involved with and also at the same time encourage people to think through the next activity that Salemi is going to have. All right. So in the U.S., each group belongs to one of the 10 different regions future here on the map. Each region have a regional coordinator like myself, I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator, who support the group leaders in each of these geographical areas. To find your local chapter or group leader, go to the main website and look for chapters under the About tab. We encourage new volunteers to seek out and connect with, their new, with the group leaders and introduce themselves to see how they can get involved. If you reach out to your group, to your local group leader and do not hear back, contact us. Sometimes emails go to spam. We can help you, we can help make the introductions in this case. If no organized group exists in your area, contact us as well and we can connect you to the people closest to you. Now we're gonna have a poll that we're gonna ask you, have you met with your group leader yet? All right, while we, while we have that poll going, we're gonna get into a new exercise. This is one to open the doors for each of us to make a bigger contribution to CCL without a lot of worry or effort. And I hope you're up for that. You can type yes in the chat if you want. This is a speed writing exercise and you could take notes on paper or on your computer. I'm going to flash some questions. I will read the question. I will tell you how I answer it. And then I want you to write down how you can answer that question. Please hang on to your answers and share your insights with your group leader. All right, so first question, Brett. What do you really care about that brought you to CCL and climate change? You all already shared that at the beginning. For me, um, it is my children. And now my grandbaby, two-year-old Isabel. And if we were in person, I'd show you pictures of her. but. I am not. What brought you to climate change and CCL? Next question. What is one of your passions outside of CCL? Y'all already know regenerative agriculture is mine. What is one of your passions outside of CCL? Next question. What is your special skill or expertise? Pat yourself on the back. We are building a team. We want to know who is going to be good in which positions on the field. Uh, as you can tell, I like giving presentations. Um, I also like to write poetry. So I'm, I'm kind of good at writing letters to the editor. It's one of my favorite first things I started doing with CCL. What's your special skill or expertise? Please be um, not modest here. Number next four, what other groups do you belong to? These are places for networking, places for presentations, tabling, outreach, newsletters. I'm a member of the Virginia Association of Biological Farmers. They have an annual meeting every year. They have a newsletter. Where do you belong? Neighborhood, civic, faith, professional. Next question, how do you like to work? Alone or with a team? In a partner, it's kind of nice to know how you like to work so your group leader can help set you up in the right situation. All right, next says we're gonna look at a checklist. Let's go ahead and flip to that checklist. Looking at that list, these are possible activities. Pick one or two or three you like doing. Also pick ones you don't like doing. It's just as good to know what you don't like doing. I can't stand, my head explodes with databases. If you want me to host a party, find me a partner who's going to manage the database. I will be the hostess. You can send me to the grocery store with what to buy. Don't ask me to plan the menu. So 
look at that first column, chatting with strangers, with p familiar folks, presenting, writing, all kinds of writing to Congress, to the editor, social media's post. Next column, events. Maybe you're planning, maybe you're hosting, designing, flyers, social media, organizing, information, volunteers, data entry. I love to have an organizing partner. Research, you might do some research online, related topics, outreach, calling, we love it when we get people calling. Phone calls are, um, are, the, are the, the grease to our wheels. Emailing, social media, technology, when we're on Zoom or in person, we might need help with projectors. Teaching, the best way to learn something is to teach. I can tell you inside and out about the Energy Innovation Act because I've had to teach it to you. <laughs> so get yourself teaching something if you wanna learn something more deeply and networking. All right, next slide. Given this self-inventory that you have done, thinking about your skills, your interests, affiliation, circumstances, here's my question. What is one way you could expand your contribution to CCL that would delight you and move us forward? So complete this sentence in the chat. I might, what might you do? I might, like I might get LTEs, letters to the editor, into rural newspapers near near me. What might you do? All right. Any anybody given any ideas there? Oh yay! I might take over as chapter leader. Woohoo! I love seeing that. All right, making phone calls and writing letters to the editor, reaching out to old friends and getting them involved. Good, good, old friends, teach and share what I know. Love that, Laura. Good, good. All right, right, having taught English composition. See, there we go, pat yourself on the back. Contribute, you certainly can. Many, many volunteers contribute. You can do that online. Research, oh, a couple of research. I might learn more about the global work we're doing. I might check with my local faith community. Wonderful, I love that. All right, I am going to share, I just put in the link, uh, link uh, in the chat, a link to this exercise. If you wanna bring this particular exercise to your chapter, it might be something your group leader would welcome if you were to lead folks through this exercise. And again, like I said, these little I might answers, you can email your group leader, call them, send them a text. I'm thinking about this, I might wanna do this. All right, that is our little exercise. And back to you, Salemi. Thank you, Ellie. Another thing about organizing in five level, if if one is stuck, we can actually pull harder on some of the other levers. For example, you might meet with your member of Congress several times, and they agree that the Energy Innovation Act is the best proposal. However, they will not support this proposal into their support from the primary voters and from businesses in the district. In this example, to demonstrate the support that the member of Congress needs, it, take, it makes sense to ramp up outreach to businesses and community leaders and also grow your group to broaden your local focal base of support. What are, what are we trying to do here is not going to be easy, but citizens who are passionate, well-trained, organized by congressional districts and who have a good system of support can more than influence the political process. We are committed to building ongoing positive relationship with our community and with members of Congress in order to create the political space that allow these members of Congress to move in the, in the direction we want. So when we talk about building a relationship, why is this important? That's a great question. So let me, let me jump in here and uh, give you at least one thought on that. And this quote comes from a report that was done by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I've just put that link if you're interested in reading the whole thing in the chat. Uh, but it's a powerful quote that reminds us that to basically reclaim the democracy and the democratic participation, the mantle that we have as constituents, we need to turn back towards one another and to really look towards one another and develop that mutuality and a responsibility for our civic life even with those that we may want to demonize or ignore, if we're really called to achieve the reinvention called for with the moment that we are faced with. And that is precisely what is at the heart of CCL's methodology. 
we are bridge builders inherently. You know, eight years ago, people said there was no way that you could get members of Congress that were Republican to introduce a resolution in Congress that said climate change was real, significantly influenced by humans, and that Congress needed to do something about it. But CCL volunteers instead chose to see that as a real possibility and worked with then Representative Gibson to introduce and then reintroduce the Republican climate resolution. Six years ago, the context of the Congress, no different than today, thought that there was no way you could get Republicans and Democrats to sit down together, much less join and form a caucus with the word climate in its title. But CCL volunteers with their dogged persistentness and commitment to relationships instead chose to see that as a possibility and formed with Representatives Deutsch and then Corbello the House Climate Solutions Caucus and now the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus, which are both working on addressing one of the most pressing issues of our time. And even three and a half, four years ago, people said there was no way that you could get both parties to sit down and introduce significant climate legislation on carbon pricing as it hadn't happened since Waxman Markey about a decade ago. But again, CCL volunteers through their work with Congress got both uh, the House and the Senate to introduce the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act two sessions ago. It was then reintroduced last session and has now been reintroduced again this session. We'll go into details in just a little bit about that policy, but again, a wonderful example of the heart of our approach. So how do we actually achieve that and what are we focused on when we do that? I'll pass it back to you, Salemi, to explore that. We have explored our values and years. We talk about our five levers of political will and how we're using them across chapters. But how do we inspire Congress to lead? And how do we get people to join us in helping Congress find its way forward on this? And how do we have those conversations? <laughs> Good question, Salemi. What we have found is that people we can learn to listen deeply in our conversations, motivational interviewing, reflective listening, values-based conversations. The sequence runs something like this. Find the other person's interest. Reflect back and confirm what you think they said. Identify and confirm their values. Find common ground with those values. Ask permission to express your thoughts related to those shared values. Now, I like to think about what it looks like when someone isn't listening deeply to me. When I feel unheard, I start repeating myself over and over, hoping that if I repeat enough, it will sink in. I might get louder and louder, hoping that they might hear me more clearly. I might get quiet and retreat and not say anything at all. If, after all, if you can't really understand what I'm saying, why would I even waste my time? I might turn on my cell phone, check my um, Facebook page, or even walk away. So let's walk through what it might mean for us to deeply listen, to use our motivational interviewing. So what, first, finding someone's interests. For example, um, we might hear someone say in a meeting, what about underserved communities? Won't they be negatively impacted by the bill? They're already suffering from COVID. So you could use the chat to think about how you might respond to that. So someone says to you in a meeting, what about underserved communities? Won't this bill hurt them? How might you respond? Go to the chat if you can and think about how you might respond. I'll give you a hint. You can always say thank you. <laughs> Anything anyone says, you can say thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you brought that up. I appreciate your concern. There we go. This bill, will <laughs> well, it will, but we don't want to bring that up quite yet. They're not ready. They're concerned. Yes. Oh my goodness, you guys, this is great. Okay, read the bill. No, not, not quite yet. <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys to pull yourselves in a little bit. We want first to listen to what their interests are. I'm glad you brought that up. I appreciate and care about low-income people too. All right, next. All right, wonderful. We have found their interests. Let's reflect back and confirm what we think we heard they said. Uh, they let, they asked about underserved communities already suffering from COVID and expressed worry that the Energy Innovation Act 
will harm those communities already suffering. Using your own words in the chat, tell them what you heard them to say and ask them to confirm or correct you. You could say, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I heard you say, if I am hearing you correctly, it sounds to me like you think, have I got that right? Let's populate the chat, confirm it what we think we heard them say. And with that, I pass it back to you, Brad, to keep us on track. All right, let's keep moving along. Pam, that was a great example. So moving on, that third step of motivational interviewing basics that we've been talking about is to identify and confirm values. And thanks everyone for playing along. Using the chat again, this time name the value. You identify and confirm that with them. Remember that you know that's what we're trying to identify when they've identified the concern. What about underserved communities? Won't they be negatively impacted? So what might you say to identify and name a value? One example might be, I'm hearing you concern, uh, express your concern or your commitment to economic justice. Is that right? What other values might be present with a concern identified? Feel free to put that in the chat and I'll pass it back to you, Salemi. So now you have identified their values and confirmed those. In our next step, we find common ground. Tell them that you share or respect their values. You could simply say, I also care about economic justice. Chat time again. Type your sentence based on the value that you identify with. Excellent. So for this last element, we're thinking through asking permission before we share our own thinking or what we might have in our head. So building on what Salemi just mentioned, you could say something like, I also value economic justice. And I was really pleased to discover that some of the co-sponsors of the Energy Innovation Act address that issue with the mechanics of the bill. Here's key, I'm asking permission. May I share how that bill creates economic justice? But use your own words. How would you ask permission to proceed to make sure that you're getting somebody's buy-in to have a conversation that they're also interested in? That's key. And uh, what we're gonna do is transition actually to another communications activity, if that's all right. So as you're practicing, using these basics of motivational interviewing for your own lobby meetings, let's put that together and kind of use this to segue into discussing the bill. And by bill, what we mean is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And to do that, we're gonna use something called our laser talks. It's what we use to improve our communications. They're, I like to think of them as bite-sized advocacy resources that are on a specific topic. You're not meant to memorize them, we're really kind of using them as background information that you can internalize in your own communications. Uh, but we take the time and put practice, uh, putting them into practice seriously with our own groups. Oftentimes one a month is part of what we do for our monthly agenda. And so one of the ways that we can do that is a laser talk specifically on the Energy Innovation Act's benefits. And I'll put a link where you can find this in the chat. And it's basically four main buckets that I'm gonna explore with you out loud here. So wherever you're at, whether you're in the comfort of your own basement or a coffee shop or whatever, I invite you to thoroughly embarrass yourself and read this out loud with me. Uh, you can click on that chat link. And let's just talk about, for example, this example of a laser talk on the benefits of the Energy Innovation Act. Here we go. So we like to think of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act as having four huge benefits. One of them is that it puts us on track to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And that's through a strong economy-wide price on carbon dioxide emissions. It's gonna help us reduce our emissions by 50% in the next decade alone. That's a huge goal that's aligned with the best available science. Another great benefit of the Energy Innovation Act is that it provides affordable, clean energy. And the way it does that is through the government setting the direction and then allowing businesses to respond in order to provide that abundant, affordable, and reliable clean energy. We all know the importance of something being both reliable and affordable, and this innovation is what's going to help us drive towards that faster through that price signal that we'll talk about in just a bit. We also know a huge impact of our current addiction to fossil fuels is the health impacts it has. We breathe polluted air through the energy that we generate for our lives. And by transitioning to a clean energy economy, this policy is gonna help improve our health and save four and a half million American lives over the next half century. 
by reducing that harmful pollution. We know that poor air quality right now sickens thousands of Americans every year and is responsible for about one in 10 Americans premature deaths today. That's a huge number and let that sink in. And lastly, we know that this policy is wonderful as well because it puts money back in your pockets, right? It's going to be affordable for all of us as ordinary Americans because that money is given to us to spend as we see fit. We like to think of it as a carbon cash back payment. There's no restrictions on how you spend it. It's a monthly dividend or a check that you'll get. And most low and middle income Americans from that dividend going back to their house will actually come out financially ahead or break even with a policy like this. So with that, that's a very brief overview for our communication activity. Uh, but keep thinking about the questions that you have. We'll have time when you get to your breakout tables to really dive in with a mentor. And let's use this to segue into talking more about the Energy Innovation Act's details. So I'll pass it back to you, Salemi. All right, we have reached the final and most essential topic before we get to practice our lobby meetings. Let's discuss the policy details behind the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Citizens Climate Lobby has advocated for a carbon fee and dividends type of pol style, style policy for more than 10 years. In late 2018, Congress introduced the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act in both the House and the Senate with both Republican and Democrat sponsors. The first time ever a bicameral bipartisan carbon price was introduced into Congress. When the 116th Congress started in January 2019, the House introduced the Bipartisan Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, H.R. 763, by Representative Deutsch and Representative Rooney as the lead Democrat and Republican sponsor, respectively. Then in 2020, in 2021, the House reintroduced the Energy Innovation Act as HR 2307, and Citizens Climate Lobby now advocates for this specific bill. So let's go under the hood and find out a little bit more about this monumental act. But first, a little review about where we are today. The price we consumer pay for fossil fuel is artificially low and historically and historically, government have seen their economic growth linked with, with incentivizing their development. Today, it's also due to several factors, including before production, fossil fuel producers receive discounted leases on public land and offshore. During production, fossil fuel producer, producers receive subsidies, special tax breaks, like the intangible drilling cost deduction and well depletion allowances, and eminent domain for pipelines. After production, the price we pay for fossil fuel do not, does not include huge hidden costs. These hidden costs are known as externality by economists, and some of them include the US military has spent trillions protecting energy supply lines all across the world. The use of coal alone increased healthcare costs 300 to 500 billion a year. And of course, there are the climate costs associated with adapting and mitigating the effects of a changing climate system. If the market price if the market price for any product, not just fossil fuel, does not include its real cost, economists call that a market failure. And global warming has been called by some the greatest micro market failure in history of capitalism. Economists said the best first step to correcting a market failure is to hold accountable, to hold a product accountable for its cost. With fossil fuels, this means Moving those hidden costs we discussed early from the military, healthcare costs, environmental damage, and climate impacts back into the balance sheet of fossil fuel producers. The idea of putting a price of carbon is simple. We add the cost of doing business in those resources because we want to reveal the hidden costs that no, that no one is taking responsibility for at the present moment. Getting the price, the price right make the market tells the truth. It transforms our economy to move in the right direction, and that means ordinary people, consumers, small businesses, 
taxpayers will recover the market leverage that they are supposed to have to determine whether we do something that is too costly or not. There is to that, so let me, and we know the solution to this, right? If we want fewer emissions, if the challenge is that we keep emitting them and putting them in the atmosphere more and more every year, then economists also have the best advice on how to address that. And that is like any product, we need to make them more expensive to account for the real costs in society. Now, one of the great corollaries to this is improving the fastest way to do something to make it uh, disappear is making it more expensive is cigarette smoking. You know, people have pointed, you know, after a substantial body of research by the National Cancer Institute and the World Health Organization, multi-decades, multi-countries, that significantly increasing the excise tax or the price of tobacco products was the single most consistently effective tool for reducing tobacco usage. So if we can take from that example and learn in our own application, let's review what the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act would actually do similar to that chart we just saw to our emissions addiction, right? So here is our regular baseline. If we should do nothing else in the current status quo for our energy sources, maintain their overall balance to the mid-century. And now let's look at this band, this pathway, what the best available science says we need to stay on track on if we are going to make sure that our overall global temperature doesn't raise more than 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. And this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's advice. So here's that band. How does the energy innovation and carbon dividend track with that? Well, pretty well. You can see here this green line shows the modeling done by Resources for the Future, and I can put a link to that when we get to Q&A in just a little bit, as well as the annual targets that the bill itself in the text sets to get us to 2050 net zero emissions. And again, a reminder that a strong economy-wide price on carbon is going to help us achieve that by putting us on track for that net zero. Polluter pays policies incentivize that expansion while sending that carbon cash back to all of us as a household. So let's explore really quickly the three fundamental elements of what creates this policy, right? I like to think of it as a three-legged stool. Each of these is equally essential. And what happens first is you put a steadily rising fee as upstream as possible in our economy on fossil fuel emissions. So right at the source, whether they're coming in from a mine, from a wellhead, from a port or a pipeline, you wanna make sure that we're being efficient with how we're levying that fee, but we're also capturing as broad as possible of those fuels. The fee starts at $15 a ton and increases $10 annually each year on top of inflation. So that's the fee. Number two, the second leg of the stool is the dividend or the carbon cash back. Basically, that means that 100% of all of that money collected, the net revenue, goes back equally to all of us as households. You, me, and Melinda Gates, we all get the same share. That's the carbon cash back part of this bill. And the money collected from that fee is given to us so that especially lower and middle income earners do not experience a rise in energy prices that they cannot afford. Again, remember, the majority of them will actually come out ahead or be protected. And it means that all of us can participate in putting solutions to work. And lastly, that third leg of the stool, which is equally critical, is focused on what do we do with our international trade policy partners. If we're going to take this ambitious climate action, we want to make sure that we're not disadvantaging American manufacturers. We're not doing that at the expense of offshoring our own, our own jobs. And so that carbon border adjustment is critical because trade lawyers assure us that it's WTO or the World Trade Organization compliant. It means that it will uphold itself in an international court of law. And it means that basically other countries that don't have ambitious policies like us would have to pay that same amount, that adjustment, to bring in their goods, to import them into our country. And that goods that we're exporting to other countries that don't have a similar type ambitious policy will have a refund so that they still remain competitive on the global market. So that's the overall strategy behind those three legs of the stool. And again, a reminder that not only are these policy efforts key, but they also bring these big benefits. 
aligning with the best available science, putting us on track for net zero emissions by mid-century, providing affordable clean energy, preventing premature deaths through those saves lives with a reduction in air pollution, and putting money back in all of our pockets. We saw the popularity and the importance of helping out in the COVID era. We wanna make sure to do the same thing as we transition on climate. So that's a very brief overview, and we'll have time now actually to kind of start thinking through your own questions. We have a couple of minutes for questions, but first let's digest the Energy Innovation Act, and I'll pass it back to you, so let me to do that. Let's digest HR 23 with a little reflection time. Imagine you're Zooming or talking with friends, families, or co-workers, and someone asks you, what did you do this weekend? You mentioned this workshop and the Energy Innovation Act. Then you describe one thing you like about the bill. You might say, I went to a virtual conference this weekend, and I learned about a bill in Congress called the Energy Innovation Act. I really like the fact that the bill and fill up the blind. Be short, sweet, and to the point. If you can find, if you cannot find something that you like, that's okay too. Hold your questions and concerns because Q&A comes next and just say pass or skip. All right, and in the chat, we're seeing all of the uh, benefits here, emissions, excited about how many aspects it covers, especially taking a big bite out of that for the next five years. Keep them coming in the chat here. And uh, we'll actually have a chance to do a quick little uh, Q&A break here too. So keep putting what you are drawn to in the bill and I'll start going to Q&A to line up with uh, some of the questions that are coming in here. Yeah, Brett, I see one right now from Leslie that says the dividend Please. leg doesn't make sense to me. If most people get money back, the energy companies will not have incentives to switch to cheaper fuel because we consumers will have the money to pay the higher cost. I love that question. I had the same question when I first was learning about this type of policy. And really what happens is we see the cost of products. First off, our biggest... Um, the biggest part of our carbon footprint are the items we buy. I thought it was like the gasoline I paid for or the power bill, but uh, it's not my electric bill. It's not the gasoline. It's the items I buy and how much energy gets used to create those and whether that energy is high carbon or low carbon. And so when you've got the cost of energy going up because um, the cost of creating that energy is going up, the cost of high carbon energy, then, you know, a, an apple grown locally suddenly becomes cheaper than an apple that's grown in China and has to be shipped across the country to get to me. So I can go to the grocery store. I'm going to see an option on apples. One is going to be the local and cheaper op option. The other is going to be the flown or boated over from China, more expensive. I don't even have to care about climate. I don't even have to think, well, am I getting that dividend in my paycheck? Am I am, not paycheck, but am I getting that dividend in my bank account every month? I don't have to think about any of that. I'm just looking at the price of apples and I make a decision to buy the apple that is less expensive. And so pretty soon other companies, not even the fuel companies are thinking, well, if we want to have a cheaper product, then we need to find a way to have cleaner energy so that our energy costs can drop. An example I love is Volvo truck manufacturing. They Their truck manufacturing around plants around the world are going zero carbon, including the one in New River Valley, Virginia. And they're doing that even before a carbon tax. And they are reducing the reducing the amount of energy they use and making their own energy right there at the truck manufacturing plant. So there are ways for companies to figure out how to make their products cheaper by avoiding the use of fossil fuel um, power. So ah, that's probably a long answer, but really people just make their decisions right there in the store. They aren't thinking, I got the dividend, I'll buy the more expensive apples. They're thinking which apples are the cheapest and they look good and taste good. And then let's see, so there are some questions. Let's look at those. Kent, I'll sort of go at, the, I'll start at the top of the list there. How can we do a better job of getting Biden administration on board? They aren't putting carbon pricing on their list of climate mitigation policies. A couple of ways. One, we have a postcards to Biden campaign, which probably, Brett, do you want to pop that link in the 
chat. You can do electronically set up to send a postcard to uh, the Biden administration. Uh, and another is to make sure that there are more and more Republicans and Democrats on board for a carbon fee and dividend style policy supporting the Energy Innovation Act or similar bills. And so when we see that interest in Congress, then we capture Biden's attention. Bob says, do you have a slide showing how energy suppliers do you have a slide showing how energy suppliers document to the government their volume so that the carbon fee? Oh, that's a good question. It's just on their tax forms. How much coal did you take out of the ground? And how much coal did you sell to the power companies? They would make that. You're, you're writing that down already. If you're a power company, we sold this many tons of coal. We made this much money. All right. Well, guess what? We know exactly how much carbon dioxide comes out of any fossil fuel. When we burn it, all we need to do is count the carbon molecules in the fossil fuel to begin with. So it's really easy, basic math, um, easy to do on a tax form. Does the bill institute any programs to help workers in fossil fuel industry switch to greener jobs? This bill doesn't. If you care about that, you might want to join our coal country action team. Um, and they, they do talk about the idea of taking a 1% or less carve out to help transition, particularly in coal communities. And it is something that people talk about. And it might be something that perhaps a Republican would bring to a bill. So it's a great idea. And it could it could be that a member of Congress brings that into the bill. That's the place to have that conversation. Can consumers still not want to buy more expensive, apply with food miles with additional dividend. Everyone gets the same dividend amount. There's no, you don't, you aren't calculating how much you spend. We're all getting the same amount. The rough estimate is a family of four in the first year will get $40 a month. Uh, and if you're poor or middle income, your cost of living will be less than $40 per month. So that's how you wind up with a little left over if you're poor or middle income. Um, does the UK have a carbon tax and border adjustment? No one yet has a border adjustment. There are plans for the EU to have a border adjustment next January. And Canada is getting ready to have a border adjustment. Um, if the US has a carbon fee, but Mexico and Canada won't. Well, Canada already does have a carbon fee and our volunteers in Canada were working hard on that. So we'll take a teeny tiny bit of credit there. Canada already does. And that when we look at the big, when we look at the industrialized countries around the world, it is just the US. And right now, Australia isn't pricing carbon. They are doing another kind of climate policy, but it is not a carbon price. Will the monthly payments people receive be reduced after a few years? Because by that point, almost all energy is clean. And at that point, will there be voter disappointment? Do we know if such a situation has happened in other countries? Okay. Yes, the eventually the bill will kind of phase itself out because we will have phased out the use of fossil fuel. The cost of the fee will go up and up and up and there will reach a point uh, maybe 30, 40 years down the road. It's not in the first two decades. I can tell you um, it has not happened yet in other countries because they haven't been pricing carbon that long and we haven't phased out of fossil fuel use. But that's what we want. We want, we want to phase it out. And that's, for me, personally, why I don't want to see this like as a tax swap because that would be a great disappointment if we were like funding the military or our schools with a carbon fee, and then it eventually phased out. We do want it to phase itself out. How do you communicate the Energy Innovation Act in one simple sentence? Oh my gosh, okay, it's, um, that's, <laughs> that is a good, I think that's where we talk about those four benefits, and you can pick one of those benefits, and when you're talking to someone, listen to them, what do they really, really care about? Are they a, a parent with young children? They might be caring about the health issues, for example, and you might speak to that. Are they someone who's just super anxious about getting this climate change solved and can't see how we might do that with time to spare? Then you might talk about the big chunk of carbon emissions that get cut out in the first five years. And we'll jump right back in. Um, we are just reminding people as I'm queuing up our slides again that all of what Ellie's highlighted is available for anyone to explore on CCL Community. It's a link I just posted at the very top of chat. So you're more than welcome to explore anything else that you might be curious about at your own time frame. 
Um, but we've got a show to get to, which is preparing you for your mock lobby meeting and getting you ready to do that. We'll pass it to you, Salemi, to get us started. All right. So after today in the real world, prior to the meeting, let me just make sure I, I am not unmuted. Um, prior to your meeting, you want to do your research and your member and the district. Learn what they're really proud of and what they like and what they have accomplished. Learn what they really annoy them so you don't bring that up during the meeting. Research local impacts of climate change. Learn how carbon fee and dividend will impact their district or state. Review previous meeting minutes and determine ahead of time who will be responsible for the follow-up. Also, assign roles, leader, timekeeper, note-taker, asker, and leader. Some of the roles, depending on the size of your team, an individual may fill multiple roles. Everyone is encouraged to participate in the discussion, but keep in mind that the most powerful people in the meeting will be the constituents and trusted messengers. You have the appreciator. Um, doesn't it makes you feel nice when you meet someone and they have something nice to say about you? How does that change the way you listen? That's the role of the appreciator. The timekeeper keeps the meeting on time, monitor, monitors percentage of time CCL and members of Congress talk with a target of 50-50. Tally number of open-ending questions our team asks for the minutes. The note taker takes the notes. If possible, you want to have a note taker that is, experience, is an experienced volunteer. This person should be able to follow the thread of the conversation, specifically capturing what is said by the member of Congress or their staff. The asker is the team is the lobby team member who represents CCL purpose and asks. If possible, you want to have someone who has a strong grasp of our policy and its wider implications or ripple effect. The asker leave always a one-page primary ask behind. Delivery. The team member who is responsible for bringing constituent correspondent or communicating leaders to or communicating leaders to the meeting. With the pandemic, those might be verbally summarized or sent in advance or sent after as part of a follow-up. The follow-up is the team member who sends the follow-up meeting materials and thank you cards. If the person doing the follow-up is not a liaison, he or she should coordinate on the follow-up items with the congressional liaison soon after the meeting. And in the virtual world, we do get a tech support um, who can help out muting and taking care of the security. A couple optional roles that I love is the observer. The team member designed to put aside any agenda for outcome and just listen for underlying needs. If they hear something that is missing or sound like a place to get more understanding, they ask about it. Finding that the opportunity to clarify needs bring further understanding and really helps the meeting. And of course, the photographer that takes the picture with the permission and to share online afterwards. Excellent. So let's also talk about that critical role of the meeting leader. So one of you in your scenario in just a little bit, and we'll go into how you can do that in a little bit, is going to take on the role of the meeting leader. An analogy that we find useful here is that of a train conductor or a, a concert conductor. The CCL team leader is there to manage the meeting, not to dominate the meeting. And they're not necessarily the one that's even going to talk the most, but really to empower everyone to share and participate to be active contributors. During the discussion, you're going to help your team remember to ask open-ended questions, to seek clarification, like we talked about with that motivational interviewing practice. You can also be the one in charge of handling those transitions between different parts of the meeting, from the beginning to the middle to the end that Ellie's going to talk about in just a moment. And you can also help facilitate as meeting leader, what's an appropriate ask for the meeting? How can you get set up for success to get your Congress member to yes on something to make sure everyone's on that same page? So what does this all look like? I'll pass it to you, Ellie, to review that. 
All right, so let's circle back to meeting roles. Brett's gonna pop up a poll. We want you to select the roles you're most interested in trying out for today's lobby stim simulation. You can select more than one. In fact, sometimes we are wearing multiple hats. As you're entering that, let's go over the basic meeting outline. We meet in teams of four to six CCL volunteers. We like to think of lobbying as a team sport. First, we start by thanking the member or the staffer for meeting with us. Then the timekeeper says, how much time do you have for this meeting? After that, we introduce ourselves briefly. If we're meeting with a staffer, we ask them to tell us about themselves. Then we show appreciation for something they've done, something we sincerely appreciate, and it does not have to be related to climate or environment. We then explain our purpose to create the political will for a livable world. We state our request up front, support or introduce legislation that puts a fee on carbon-based fuels and returns the net revenue to American households. We mentioned that we, we will say more on that, but first we wanna discuss their concerns. Now we've got that middle, listening and discussing. We've got some questions you might ask. Remember that reflective listening we practiced and played around with earlier. You might ask, what's preventing the representative from supporting our legislation? Or who in our district would we need to convince about the merits of our proposal to win your support? You might ask, what is your preferred plan to lower emissions? Or you might have done some research uh, to have some other questions in mind, and certainly your research would let you anticipate how they might answer these questions. That was the middle. Now we're going to move to the end. Finally, we make our ask. If they've indicated they are not ready to introduce or support the bill, then include a secondary ask, a stepping stone type of an ask, something a little easier for them to do, but related and bipartisan. We could offer materials. Would you like a hard copy or electronic? How might we follow up with you? We also ask, who do they work with across the aisle? And of course, we thank them for their time. So that's the overview of a meeting like a good story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Brett, over to you to get us ready. So what we're gonna do is actually transition into breakouts. And what we mean by that is that after another five minutes, we're gonna put you into a table, or we're actually gonna ask you to put yourself into a table um, with some other uh, attendees for the Climate Advocate Training Workshop. And I'll review how to do that in just a moment. But here's how we're gonna spend the next 40 minutes at those tables, as just a reminder. You're gonna first jump into that table. You're gonna have 10 minutes to get settled. I'm gonna stay on here if you're having any tech questions. And then when you get to your table, you'll be able to ask your mentor more questions that we didn't get to in this large group because there's over 120 of us. You'll be able to start getting to know each other and you'll also just really settle in. The next 10 minutes, you'll be able to then start preparing for your meeting. Your mentor is gonna share who they're representing. You're gonna decide on the roles that you wanna take on and what your team's plan is. And then next after that, you're actually gonna practice holding a very brief 10 minute meeting with your team. Now we realize that this is lightning paced, so it's not gonna go perfectly. You're probably not going to feel ready uh, when that 10 minutes hits, but that's okay. Today is meant to simulate the overall experience with the limited parameters of time that we have. And then lastly, those final 10 minutes in your table breakout group you're gonna debrief. What were your takeaways? What did you learn from this exchange? What would you dif do differently or try out next time? It's really up to you to think through what you'd like to look through. But as a review, again, we'll start in three minutes leaving here. So that makes 2.30 Eastern, the time when you're transitioning to your tables. And then 2.40 is when you start with your meetings. 2.50, or uh, 2.40 is when you start preparing for your meetings. 2.50 is when you hold your meeting, and three o'clock is when you start the debrief. And your mentor will have all of that information available for them, so you don't have to remember, but I'm giving you an overview just so that you have a little bit of an insight into our process for the next 40 minutes. So how do we actually achieve that? Well, in two minutes, 
I'm just going to review this slide and then stay on for people's questions, but you're able to jump off after this. Click out of this training workshop, and you'll see in the upper left of this panel a little back arrow. That will allow you to go back to the, uh, the sessions in the schedule, and across the very top, you're going to see an option that says lounge. That's what's highlighted there on the slide in that red box. So you're going to click the back arrow and then on lounge. And then what you're going to do is scroll to the open tables that are labeled CAT W. And that acronym is short for Climate Advocate Training Workshop. You can think through, hey, who is my representative, my member of Congress? You know, it's a Senate um, Republican. It's a House Democrat that's already sponsored. You can pick a table that aligns with your member's background, or you can just find an open table. What we're going to encourage you to do, though, is start from table 37 and keep scrolling down if that table looks filled up and find an open table. So you're kind of filling from a low number of 37 all the way down in those tables. You're going to see one mentor per group, and that's going to work out really well because ideally we have five to six of you in each of these tables where you can really practice and interact with each other. And on this slide, you can also see at the very bottom right corner what that looks like when you're in a table. It's basically like a little Zoom meeting. And so if you click on a table, there's gonna be an option at the bottom to say join. And then once you're joining, it'll take a moment to connect. You're then gonna be prompted to click on your microphone icon to unmute and your video icon if you wanna share your video. Now, if you can't share your video, that's fine. The main thing is the audio, uh, but that is the perfect overview of how to find your tables. The back arrow, and then lounge on the very top white navigation bar, scroll down, look for an open Cat W table, and start joining by clicking on that join button. We are at time where it's exactly at 2.30 Eastern. Please feel free to leave here and jump into those tables. So Lemmy and Ellie will help you out too. Uh, we've got mentors eagerly awaiting for you. Is there anything that either of you two wanna add before we remind you that we are regrouping here in 40 minutes? We are going to digest the workshop for a moment. Think about what touched us, what spoke to us, what made us look at something in a different way. What did we hear with fresh ears? Please go to the chat and share whatever take home nuggets you had. Maybe it was something in the mock lobby meeting. Maybe it was a new way of looking at our values or the five levers or what you wanna do next. Share with us in the chat, whatever it is that you're gonna be chewing on uh, for the rest of the afternoon. We follow directions, says <laughs> Tamara. Yes, you did. We were like, did they make it to the tables and back? That's what we wanted to know, and you guys did. So we were delighted to get a little movement out of Ted Cruz. Yes, that's wonderful. It's fun to play with how that might happen. So you can picture it, because we often picture how it's not going to happen. Oh, this other person's not going to do what we want them to do. And then we can't see the openings. I want to follow up more with motivational interviewing training. We've got that on community. Brett might be able to find a link for you. It was very interesting mock meeting. Thank you so much for all this effort. That was a lot of fun. I feel empowered. Yes. Danny's ask of Republicans in the house worked. <laughs> Lindsay must have been convinced as a house Republican. Bill played a fabulous senator. Nice. Love it. All right. Just one table left, I think, says Debbie. Got, su got suggestions from good mentor and table suggestions. Yes, hang on to your mentors and feel free to, you know, if you need to reach out, they might be someone who could re respond to any questions. Brett has put the link to motivational interviewing. It's uh, a workshop and then it's also um, part of an action team. You can find our action team around that. Danny's, okay, oh, little compliments going back and forth there. All right. Well, wonderful. It, we had a lot of fun with you guys and appreciate you being such good sports for doing this in this little matrix of a, of a system that we were, we're all working with because of the little last endings, knock on wood, of the pandemic. So let me turn to Salemi and find out what is next. Salemi, what is next? Of course. So 
so what is next? Reach out to your lobby meeting leaders or group leader to confirm the next step for your lobby meeting plan coming next week and local group involvement. And join our monthly calling campaign at www.cclusa.org forward slash MCC. And if you already sign up, text this link to your friends and family members to join the movement. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, we love the monthly calling campaign. All right. So, Brett, that next slide, if you'll pop that up, that's our contact information. You are welcome to reach out to any or all of the three of us. We want to thank you so much for taking your time to join us today. Um, we do have to end this because we said we'd only be on here for two and a half hours. We are so grateful for all of your efforts. So, Lemmy, do you want to close this off by any other words of wisdom or reading this quote you tell us? No, that's okay. I'm just going to put hearts to thank you, all of you, for joining us today. You can read this part if you want. <laughs> And I'm going to say bye with a lot of hearts because I really appreciate all of you and the great work you do. Love you guys. Hey, well, as always, we hope that you found today's workshop empowering, educational, and informative. And we look forward to connecting with you in all ahead. So reach out. Don't be a stranger. And let us know how your lobby meetings go this next week with your own member of Congress. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.